Thank you, Jesus. The Word of God says that in His presence, there's fullness of joy. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I feel joyful this morning to worship Him. Thank you, Jesus.
spot, but it's okay. All right.
thank you, Jesus. I don't want to take up any more time as you're preparing your offering today. We thank you so much for being here, each and every one of you that made an effort to be here. And I got up this morning and I said, peace, be still. Storm, go away and come on, sunshine. God honored my request. And the storm passed away. So we're just excited that you're here. Which we're very excited about the Larry Lee's here. Appreciate every one of you today. I thank you for your faithfulness and your giving. So today as you bring your offering, bring it as an act of worship. And may the Lord richly bless you and multiply his blessings in your life. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We'd like to keep you limber and exercise, so let's stand up one more time. Amen. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy and the precious blood of Jesus. We thank you for every person here. We speak blessings over their lives as they bring their offering today that it be acceptable in your sight. We bring it, Lord, as an offering to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you as you give. Hello, my name is David Sears, pastor of Jubilee Worship Center, the best kept secret in Tulsa. Come experience Jubilee Worship Center. My name's David Sears, pastor. Good morning. Good morning. I just put a mint in my mouth. Just put a mint in your mouth and just spit it out. Good morning. Good morning. What a great service. Uh, in the next few minutes, <clears throat> there's uh, tears and things of that nature. Just continue on. Find someone next to you that doesn't make you uncomfortable. Talk to them. That's fine. Get some Kleenex. They're all under the chairs. You might have a time that you need to. Uh... This is. Uh, Almost ready. Get your tassels straight. There we are. Julie Worship Center, please welcome our seniors this year.
her creativeness, if that's a word, I have no idea. Her creativity, her heart, and so much a part of this group. She was raised in our youth group here at Apex. Her sister before her, brother before her, and I'll put it this way, she has held the name very, very, very well as she's come through high school and through our youth group. Very proud. trying to take from her since she was little. But I know full well with her mom, with her church, with people that are around her for prayer, not only is she going to go far, but she's going to achieve what God has yes. yeah. purpose for her and the plan he has for her life. Yeah. Yeah. Very proud of potential, not complete, but you've seen so many changes in them, and then you got to let them go. <laughs> but uh, they're an awesome group of kids, or young people, and uh, we're so thankful for our youth in this church. Amen? Amen? They're a vital part of this church. They always have been Jubilee, and Jubilee, it's a strong part of our vision. The youth of this church is a strong part of our vision. Amen? Amen. Just want to make a few announcements. How many have been enjoying the Wednesday night uh, Bible study? Our foundation so we are going to see you again, see Debbie today for uh, to do the food for Wednesday. Just wanted to remind you of that. And we always have prayer here on Tuesday night at 630. Please join us. I'm, I'm not. Jordan's good to see you. Good Amen. to see you, brother. Ricky, David. Okay. Okay, so, uh, good to see you. recognize uh, Jalen in this group. Jalen, stand on and see how tall you are. I want to encourage you to be sure to be here tonight. Everything will be back. Service starts at 7. We normally do 6 o'clock Sunday night services, but tonight it will be at 7. I want to encourage you to be here and bring somebody with you. They will be in for a life-changing life service. Those of you that are here today, you will witness that. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I just want to tell you that in 1983, when uh, I got a hold of Dr. Larry Lee's a tapes on the revelation the Lord gave him on the Lord's Prayer. It totally changed my life. 
was raised in church. I believed in prayer. It totally, totally changed my life. And I can tell you, it's part of the reason I'm standing here doing what I'm doing today. Yeah. Yeah. It's part of the reason I'm standing here. You guys have heard me talk about it since we started this church. In fact, I believe the first six weeks we started Jubilee every Wednesday night, I taught the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> so, would you stand and give Dr. Larry Lee a great big Jubilee welcome? <laughs> Jesus would never deceive us. All that we have and all that we will be is because of His grace. Because of what He's given. You have nothing. Man has nothing, the Bible says, except what he received. Even your audible eyes, as you look at me right now, were gifts. Who made man's mind? Who made man's mouth? The Lord asked Moses. And so today, I'm going to ask you, with your pastor, who has so graciously received me through the years, and especially today, and celebrating his birthday weekend, and the anniversary to his lovely wife, and to the entire congregation, I give you a tremendous, heartfelt, God bless you, and thank you for your hospitality, and beyond that, I pray that all of you today will open your hearts past the audible and the physical and the natural. The Bible says, though we have known each other after the flesh, now we don't know anyone after the flesh. We've known Christ after the flesh, but now, henceforth, we know Him no more according to the flesh. We must know Him by the Spirit. And even so, we must know each other that way too. Everyone in this room has got feet of clay up to their armpits and above. But by grace, there has been imputed a grace and a righteousness that is not our own. We are a new species, a new creation. We're brand new by the Spirit. And if you view the man standing here as a son, man who wrote a book one time and pastor of a large church and just a natural man, you're going to miss the word. Even if you hear it with your audible ears, you'll not hear it in your spirit. You know when you put a quarter in a Coke machine and the quarter goes all the way to the bottom. You also know when it sticks. And you stand there and hit that thing all day, it won't, won't make it go down sometimes. And even so, I'm going to say some things here in this pulpit today that I want you to receive by the spirit. And in that, there's a law of, of reception or the law of reciprocity. When you receive someone sent by the Lord, what was the Lord's promise? If you receive one sent by the Lord, you will receive His reward. I mean, know that I didn't fly 1,500 miles to get here, make two stops to go back to the West Coast tomorrow and take my reward with me. I'm going to leave it with you. Oh, yeah. You hear what I'm saying? I can come here for me. I can here to release something in you. I'm going to pray two prayers today that God's going to answer. I'm going to pray one this morning. I'm going to pray one this evening. I love to pray prayers. I know God will answer. These prayers are not for me. Although I claimed them many years ago and I walk in these realities that I'm about to share this morning at 9 at 7 p.m. I know it's not normal for us anymore to go to church. It's like it's not normal for preachers to wear suits. Amen. On Sunday night, people don't go to church on Sunday night. Pastors don't, really don't wear suits anymore. That's all right. God's not looking at the outward man. Amen. Which is the way I was raised. And if you feel more comfortable in a golf shirt, I'm more comfortable with you in a golf shirt. Amen. Or a t-shirt. Amen. Just put a shirt on, for God's sake. You still love your way back. Amen. But now you know me a little bit, would you reach a hand out toward me, please, and just I receive you in the name of Jesus. Not in your name, not in your life, but by the life of Christ, 
that lives in you. I receive the gift. Give it to me right now. And the reward that is promised in this reception. Now put your hand over your heart and let me read my hand back to you. I'm going to speak something to you. Father, you know that you've given me a grace to remember people I preached to. The man I met at the back door, I knew I'd preached to him before. This young man here at the front gave me this incredible com confirming word about my own life. Lord, I, I, I knew I'd spoken to him before. Lord, as the spiritual radar goes off on the inside of me and I map these people into my heart in the matrix of my spirit, they'll come back to me in the middle of the night. Lord, you'll pray for them through me as I do now in Jesus' name that not one of them will neglect so great salvation. For Lord, we have not rejected the word, but sometimes we neglect the word. Let us not neglect it today because it will never pass this way like this again. This is the day the Lord has made. Somebody help me. And I will rejoice and be glad. And oh yes, I will rejoice that there's a word being sent on this Pentecost Sunday. As certainly as Simon Peter stood on the day of Pentecost and said, this is that. A man who would have been rejected in our day as an apostate apostle, denying Christ a little bit more than 50 days before, many no doubt said he has no right to stand there until he spoke. This is that which the prophet has made. And in one three-minute sermon, 3,000 were saved. Today in Tulsa, there'll be 3,000 sermons and only one or two will get saved. And the tragedy of that is the Word is not received by the Spirit. Received in the natural. God, today I release this word in every heart. And it will go down all the way into the bottom of their spirit and to rule their minds and control their bodies. From this point on, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated and may the Lord bless you. Thank you so much for being so close there at that, that instrument. Don't go, don't go too far because you know, Sunday morning I don't preach long, but I do preach strong. Yeah. <laughs> And I pray that you will join me in receiving even more than what I say because there are so many times, uh, there are so many times, what is your name, young lady? Cindy, God bless you. Thank you for your service. So many times as I stand before congregations such as this, down through the years, I have, I have known that what I was coming to say, what I, the Lord gave me to say was for for each individual that had an ear to hear. But past that, it was also for the congregation as a, as a corporate body. And you know when he says, you are the temple of God, a house of prayer, he's not just talking to you singularly, he's talking to you corporately. And he's not just talking to you corporately, he's talking to you singularly. You're the living stones of the house of God. He's built a house, amen, but it's not made with bricks and mortar and stone and concrete. Our wood is made by the hearts and the lives of those that have joined themselves together. This finger does not fit on my ear. It fits right here on my hand. And I don't, I, I, I fit here today. Amen. Amen. Because I have been received and I'm under the authority of the man of God who served so faithfully here. And I want to say a tremendous thank you to Pastor David for his life of service. But beyond that, I want to thank him for being a man truly after God's own heart. We love you, Pastor. We honor you. We thank God for you. We love this lady, Mary. We're glad he is 71 years old later. And he has served you down in his heart. God's hand is on you. And uh, in the next few years, before you go to heaven, you're going to see something pass. And I believe this morning is connected to it. You're going to see something far beyond what you've seen previously. Because God is really moving throughout our world today. When I resigned at Church on the Rock after pastoring 14 people on the first Sunday, till it became a church of 11,000 people in a town of 5,000. 
I don't think y'all heard that. I won't run it by again, but ask your neighbor what I just said. And you'll figure out uh, that the good old boys in Rockwell, Texas, that own that county, and it's the smallest geographical county in the state of Texas, which is, as you know, a large state, and uh, there are thousands of little bitty counties like Rockwall County. The cumulant number of those that live in Rockwall County, just when I moved there was just a little over 5,000 in the whole county. And by the end of the fifth year, we had over 5,000 people attending church. And by miracle after miracle after miracle, and I'll come quickly today to the text, we saw the hand of God. And it's a very, very unique thing. The first thing I heard driving across the lake the morning the church was birthed, and I'd already been a youth pastor in a church that we had 50 in that youth group, and it went to 4,000 young people. Somebody say 4,000 young people. The church was 6,000. And I was offered to pastor that church, but the Lord told me no to go and get a revelation on prayer. And I spent 18 months with a man uh, on my face from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. for 18 months. And in the middle of that season of prayer, the Lord gave me the revelation that David made reference to. It didn't come to me by flesh and blood because I spent four years in uh, university training with a double major in Greek and in Bible and then six more years in seminary. And I agree with the Apostle Paul, or I agree with the people that said to Paul, much learning hath made thee mad. Or maybe crazy. I had, then I did two doctors after that, and I kept arguing with God all the way through. Until in 1986, old Roberts called me and said, you, you better come and be the dean of our seminary, or we're going to throw it in the Arkansas River, and there's no water out there right now. I'll never forget that conversation either. Well, Brother Roberts had been affected by that because I preached seven hours at Brother Copeland's Believers Convention. I, I preached all day on a Saturday. He taped it all and took it to Brother Roberts and he listened to all seven hours, seven times. And he came to hear me preach at the Baby Center. I was preaching there years ago with our dear, beloved friend who's now in heaven with Jesus, Billy Joe Darden. Be that as it may, Oral walked up to me and he said, I'm old Roberts. And I looked up at him and I was praying in a corner and I said, I know. <laughs> I don't know if that would shock you if Oral came and said, I've come to hear you preach. But my butterflies became buzzards. <laughs> and they were flying around as he sat right in front of me. And I never heard this term when the service was done. He seemed to have enjoyed what he heard because obviously he'd heard it before. He got up and he came put his hand on me. The first time I'd ever heard the term or the phrase, apostle of prayer. First time it had ever been said over me. But then after that, that was the common phrase that was used. Now 61 nations later, most of them I've been at least five times soon. Uh, India seven times, Africa eight times, Israel 19 times, Eurasia more times than I can remember, Latin America, all the nations throughout. Since I resigned the Church on the Rock, I had a choice. He said, if you'll sow this one church to me, by then we had 50 acres and all the land built out, the state of the art, everything. He said, you sow this to me, I'll give you the nations of the world with suffering. And I said to the Lord, after a bit of, of uh, 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 after a bit of cogitation, a bit of, 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 of divine uh, uh, dealings, and confirmation after confirmation to finally either do it or you're going to be living in sin while pastoring this great church. So many people settle for less. Amen. I'd rather be standing here than be the President of the United States today. Y'all don't think y'all believe that, but I'm telling you this is the truth. I'd rather be standing in this office than in that office. Because I'm standing in my office today. And I'm going to pray a prayer in just a minute. God's about to answer. I love to pray prayers. I already know He's going to answer. Amen. And uh, the Lord said, give me this church. Sow it to me. All the years, all the labor, everything you preached, what God has done, he said, and I will give you the nations, the world, suffering. Most people don't like that with suffering, but I said, Lord, I can handle the suffering if you'll give me the nations, the world. I'm sharing this with you because I'm telling you how I got here today. I was sitting uh, at Bishop Gary McIntosh's about four weeks ago, I guess it was, a pastor, and I was praying through the morning as I do every day. That's what I do. I give my mornings to God. 
And through the morning, I was preaching that morning meeting, so I had to get up pretty early. And I didn't even know what time I got up, but it was sometime around daybreak. And I was praying all the way through the morning, and the Lord finally, he whispered to me, said, someone's going to tap you on the shoulder and invite you to their church, and you're not going to pray about it. You're going to turn around and say, I will come. You're not to look at them, ask who it is, say, I will come, even before they say it. So I had to say it about three times, and about ten minutes later, your pastor taught me on the shoulder and said, Dr. Lee, would you ever consider coming to our church? I said, I'll be there next Sunday if you want to. <laughs> Just like that. Well, that is not, that is not, a, that's not a rare thing for me, but it was unique that day. He said, well, give me a couple weeks to prepare. And I said, let's do it that way. And that's how I got here on this special Pentecost Sunday, your birthday, your anniversary. God's time is always right. Amen. 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 It's never late. He's always right on time. And so I stand here knowing in my knower that I'm in the right place at the right time and I have the right word for you. The word is very simple that you are going to see his hand now in your life. And in seeing his hand there will be an incredible law of reciprocity that, that uh, is beyond anything you've ever seen before. The problem with folks in a religious community like Tulsa, they think they've already seen everything. But my Bible reads like this, from the Lord, God spoke through his prophet Jeremiah saying, hold to me, now listen carefully, and I will answer thee. He didn't say I can or I might, but I will. And I will show you great and mighty things that you know not. How many of you like to see something you've never seen before? Amen. And how many like to see that through you? In you, to you, and through you is how it's going to go down. I'm going to read a couple of passages in the Bible uh, because I, I, I like to have a text that I work from and I pray it doesn't offend anybody for me to read the Bible in church. Amen. Or turn in my Bible with all due respect to my computer. Amen. Or I am writing a new book right now entitled 365 Reasons to Have a Grateful Day. Y'all missed that. Amen. Not have a great day, but how to have a grateful day. I mean, like to learn that. Amen. If you read this book, you will never be ungrateful again. I would, I would go ahead and tell you one of them. Okay, I will just tell you one. How many, of you, how many of you will agree with me? You never want to fall into homosexuality. Now I just woke up the whole church. Amen. With all due, with all due respect, to all humankind. Let me say that all of you, when they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God. Neither were they grateful or thankful. Wherefore God turned them over. This is little things in the Bible. I just thought I'd drop that in. And I know I have a book here to sell. Amen. Matter of fact, people are selling my books without my permission on Amazon right now. We looked at them this morning. Oh, they're making money. I hope they enjoy it. Amen. But I'm getting the benefit. Somebody say benefit. That's what you gotta you got that's the best kind of fit you'll ever have is a benefit. Amen. Look at uh, Luke chapter five with me. And we'll begin this incredible work on the hand of God. We're going to see the hand of God manifested in and through Jubilee Christian Center. That means you. It says it happened on, in chapter 5 of the Gospel of Luke. I'm reading this out of Luke's Gospel. The only Gentile writer of the New Testament was a medical doctor in his day. God chose Luke to write about the great miracles. And his favorite word was immediately and suddenly. And immediately, you'll see it here in this text, and you'll see it in another just a moment. He not only wrote the book of Luke, but he also wrote the miracle book of Acts. And it happened in verse 12 of chapter 5. When he was in a certain city that there was a man full of leprosy, and he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and, and pouring him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus put his hand, put out his hand, Somebody say he touched him. He said, I am willing to be clean. And immediately, somebody say immediately, his leprosy fell from him. Jesus broke, broke the law of all the norms of, of, of culture 
and the laws that had been laid down by the Jewish uh, fathers that you don't touch a leper because leprosy is a sin or is a is a uh, is a sickness that has its roots in a cancerous cankerous disease so gross that that oozing sores fill the body and you can't even recognize the human being if they're full of leprosy. But immediately, somebody say it again, immediately his skin became like the skin of a newborn baby. Right before their eyes. They saw it immediately. How many here need it immediately today? Amen. By the hand of the Lord you see it. And then beginning reading, I want you to look over Acts chapter 4 and I could show you many immediately and suddenly here, but I just want to go to one or two quickly. It says, it, and, and, and I, I, let me back up to three for just a moment. He took him by the right hand, verse seven. The Bible says he took him by his right hand. This is Peter at the gate beautiful. The man over 40 years of age would have been known as Mr. Wobbly Feet. But you see, he had no ankle bones. The idea that is conveyed here by this doctor who wrote very, very uh, uh, precise language as I've studied this, and as I've looked very, very carefully in the language at it, he had no sinew, no bone, nor any tendon. When he was born, he was born with his feet deformed to the point that they literally just wobbled. And he was laid from the time he could speak words at the gate beautiful. Because people coming and going into the temple, they could not come into the temple without an offering. And most of them had most of what they had still in their pocket when they left. Amen. It's not how much you give, it's how much you have left over after you give. It's what matters. And he knew they'd have a lot left over in coming and going. And that's when they laid him to beg for alms. And he looked at Peter and John thinking he would receive something as they are going to the place of prayer. That's something I won't preach about right now, but may I just say, Jesus is praying for you right now. The Holy Spirit is praying in you right now. And if you aren't living a prayer life, a prayer-based life, that's what you will call depression someday. But it's nothing more than a grieved Holy Spirit in you who wants to pray through you. Oh, I don't think you heard that very well, but you'll get it later. The Lord will tell you later when you read in Romans 8, of all places, where people don't even see it. In that same chapter, he says Jesus is the intercessor in heaven, and the Holy Spirit is the intercessor in you that groans with groanings that cannot be uttered intelligibly. Most people believe that's a reference to praying in the Spirit. Regardless of whether you pray in the Spirit or not, you don't have to, you get to. Amen. Amen. But Peter and John and the Virgin Mary were all Pentecostals. Oh. <laughs> you ever think about the Virgin Mary was there on the day of Pentecost and they all spake the tongues? You ever think about her being a wild-eyed Pentecostal? <laughs> Probably not. Amen. But she was. Because so she was there at the hour of prayer, verse 1 of chapter 3. And it says, he took him by the right hand, this poor man with wobbly feet. Fixing his eyes on Peter and John, he looked up, expecting to receive something from them. And the Bible says in verse 7, he took him, Peter, reached his hand out. He said, silver and gold in verse 6, I don't have. What I have I give you in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And he took him by the right hand. Somebody say he touched him with his right hand. Now in the natural, he had feet of clay, like I said. He was not a holy man in his flesh, but holiness and righteousness had been imputed to him as a gift. Those who received the abundance of grace and righteousness as a gift reign in this life. Those who do not receive righteousness by grace and as a gift of righteousness put in, we have to work out what he puts in. We have to be willing to say, uh, I haven't apprehended, I'm not perfect, but I'm pressing to let the life of Christ be the life whereby I live. Yet not I, but it's Christ living in me. Christ is a reference to the anointing that's in you and upon you today. Coming very quickly to this prayer that I'm going to pray. Oh, I pray that you can receive it today because if you get in agreement with this, you'll never be the same again. And he took you by his right hand and immediately lifted him up they said he lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones. Do you see that? They received strength. The, the, the reference here is that he had no bones. 
The reference here is there were no tendons. They literally just flopped. And all of a sudden, a doctor riding here says his ankle bones were cut, received strengths as they were connected and became strong. And he began to jump up and down, leap and praise God. The man was over 40 years of age and everybody in town knew it. Because most people didn't live 50 years in the day Christ was alive. If they lived past 50, they were considered elders or older folks. And most of us had lived past 50. And some of y'all looking at me like I'm an old man. I'm going to tell you, I'm a young man. Praise God. I'm a, I'll be a good old man someday. Praise God. Now, if you turn over... We see that the rest of chapter 3 and 4 is a great controversy that goes on from the Pharisees, these same people that murdered Christ, the same people that consented to the Roman edict and, and released Christ who had already laid down his life, for they did not kill him. He laid down his own life. Nobody took his life from him. But it was the same people. And they perceived, it says in, 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 in chapter 4, verse 13, they perceived that these ignorant and unlearned men who had done this great miracle on this man by touching the hand. The hand of Jesus now is touching through Peter. Are you seeing this? Somebody say, it's not I. But it's Christ living through me. And that same spirit. Somebody say, same spirit. You see, there's not two Holy Spirits. There's not one on Jesus and one on the apostles and one on us. There are three Holy Spirits. That's what you taught me in, about, in, 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 in theology. Uh, boy, I was, they were glad when I graduated. Amen. Because I'm the original Baptist. Amen. And some of y'all don't know what that means. But you, your friend will tell you. I was raised, I'm a fourth generation uh, Baptist and all of my grandfather, my father, grandfather, grandfather before him were, bad, were deacons in the Baptist church. And so when I'm being raised a Baptist, got saved. You know Baptists make good Christians. When they really get saved, boy, they make great Christians. And when I got saved, being already baptized and a member of the church, I got saved. I got all the way saved. I got so saved that I had a case of the can't help it. And that's what Peter told these men when they perceived that, that these men had been with Jesus. They were doing the works of Christ and what they didn't know is Christ was doing the work through them. This same Jesus, yesterday, today, and forever, we say it, but do you really believe it? This same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. So they have this controversy because they can't deny the man was healed and they all knew it. So they threaten them and they say, speak no more in his name. Peter looks at him and says, whether it's right to obey God, God or you, you Jews. But we cannot. Help it. Now that's the case of the king help us. I will preach Jesus wherever I am. Everybody gets in front of me for five, ten minutes. I'm going to hear something that the Lord has done in the now. I have to tell you. I have seen the hand of the Lord on my life. I have to do it. I don't only get to do it. I have to do it. I'm constrained. I am compelled. I'm not going to talk to you about the weather. Only to say God is in control of all things and can tell the storm to blow on by so I can get more people out on Sunday. Amen. Because I was waking, awakened in the middle of the night and I told the storm to get on down the road. For I have that authority in His name. Not me. His name. Through faith in His name. You can speak in His name. That means under His authority and by His will. When the Spirit quickens you, you can say what He said. Right. And I didn't say what He said. You can say what He is saying. Right. In the now. And when you do that, He will do these same things that He did yesterday, somebody help me, today, and then tomorrow and forever. Oh, I'm coming to this prayer quickly now. Because I'm going to pray it over you in just a moment. Oh, here it was. For we cannot but speak. It says it in chapter 4 and verse 20. For the man over 40 years of age. Then when they went back to their company, they called not the ACLU. They didn't call the lawyers. They didn't call somebody to help them out with this social problem they had. Because you see, if they got kicked out of the synagogue, which they did, 
or trusting Christ, they couldn't work. And if they couldn't work, they couldn't earn. And if they couldn't earn, they couldn't eat. They were twice enslaved. First to the Roman government. Secondly, in their own Jewish faith, they had no ability to earn money. Now that would put most of you out of the church. If the day you were told, not only your tax deductible gifts no longer tax deductible, most of us would stop giving. But that day is coming, and if you don't believe it, read the newspaper of what our own government has been doing recently. That's all about their man because nonprofit corporations give tax deductions. God have mercy on the United States of America right now, I pray. While I honor people for their positions, I do not honor unrighteousness and impropriety. May I say publicly today that, that there will be a day you will sow because you know you're living in a new economy. You're not living according to the economy of the United States of America. You're living in the economy of the kingdom of God. And when you sow to God, He will return it. The law of reciprocity is still in effect today. No matter the abuses on that law, it is not man's law. And it's been written out even in Tulsa, Oklahoma as a write-off. That we don't want to talk about that anymore. But it's a law, ladies and gentlemen. One time I jumped off an eight-foot stage not knowing what I did. I did it. When I was telling people how I got, got delivered from the fear of heights, I, jumped, I got up on an a, 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 a eight, 18 foot uh, 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 swimming pool, high dive, but I, I had a fear of heights and I ran off and hollered if y'all are uh, Native Americans, please don't think I'm being a bigot here because I'm not. But I ran off and hollered Geronimo to the top of my lungs. <laughs> and I jumped off the thing and I was never afraid again. Amen. Amen. Somebody say, step toward the barking dog. Amen. If he starts chasing you, i got some deep theology for you now. This is two doctors talking to you. You've got two legs and he's got four. <laughs> and he will bite you in your hinder parts. <laughs> if you run from him, that's when he runs after you. If you turn around and face him and run at him, he'll run from you. Especially if you bark at him. <laughs> I had to prove that the next day after I preached it the first time. Two black bulldogs, uh, or, or they were not bulldogs, they looked like a cross between a little bulldog and a, and, a, and a pit bull. They came out from under, I was doing my three mile run, and I still do three miles every morning. And actually I do it walking now. I was telling David, the, the other book I'm writing is Walk and Pray the Jesus Way. Amen. Amen. And, and, and that's how I lost 55 pounds. Praise God. And I'm not bragging about being skinny. I'll tell you how I lost it, though. I was walking, and every seven minutes I'd spend on one part of the prayer that teaches us how to pray. How many know the prayer that teaches you how to pray? It has seven parts. It starts with your Father. Aren't you glad He's not just God out there to turn the world loose? He is your Father. Every part of it's bought by the blood. And I spend seven minutes, and this is not legalism, ladies and gentlemen. This is the way, this is the way it flows out of me. Seven minutes on each part. That takes me down to 49 minutes. He said, what about the hour? I sit and listen for 11 more minutes at least. Usually that comes into three hours. And from there, I can stand up here and tell you I know what I'm doing. Yes. Amen. I mean, you know, you don't, play, you don't pay a plumber to, to do brain surgery. Amen. And have him work by the hour. Amen. You better bring somebody in that knows what they're doing. And I'm not about boasting in my flesh here. I'm boasting in his ability to work grace through uh, an obedience to the things which I have suffered. Can I just say that's how Jesus learned as well? I thought I'd drop that in on the side. And how, why would he have to learn obedience if he'd never seen it? Because he was, a, he was born of a virgin, but he lived a full life as a man anointed by the Holy Spirit, just like you do yet without sin, ever. The only thing he never had to do that you have to do is he never had to confess a sin. And to pray repetitively is a sin. Jesus sinned in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that with other misnomers that have been taught around the town here. I'll move on. Hey Amen. If you still love me way back, then the rest of you just have to deal with me. As I will deal with you, I'll forgive you and love you. If I have to love the devil, I'm sorry. Amen. All right. I'm going to go down quickly. 
It says, Now, Lord, behold their threatenings in verse 29. By stretching out your hand to heal. And when they, and the, when they prayed, somebody said, when they prayed. The place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And there they went again. They needed a fresh and filling from Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. When they were filled, Peter spoke boldly. 3,000 were saved. But now, going through the miracle that brought the, 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 the manifestation will always bring a confrontation by religious folks. As you begin to see the hand of God move in this church, you'll find out the religious spirits that are around because things will happen never happened before. And everybody pretty well likes things the way they've always been. But can I tell you, God's going to bring some people in here ain't like you. That boy played that guitar a minute ago, and I had to remember when they told me we don't play guitars in this church. I mean, I remember times and seasons when God shifted gears and opened portals, doors, opportunities, new things, birthed by the Spirit of God. That was just born of God will overcome the world. And something new happened right after this. The hand of God manifested through a man named Job. In the, in the Hebrew language, or in the Hebrew culture, if you named one of your children, Job or Joseph or Joseph, which was a very common name and a very well-known name in the Bible, in their common, in, 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 among the commoners, if you will, the word Joseph or Job means just one more. That means he had a lot of sons and he couldn't think of another name so he just named him one more. Y'all hear what I just said? That really built your self-image if you grew up just made one more. Did you get that? So here's Joseph, but Joseph decided he wasn't just going to be one more. He became wealthy somehow. He was a Levite from Cyprus. And having land in Cyprus was like owning waterfront property in Maui, Hawaii. What would it be worth to own 20 acres on the waterfront right by the Hilton Hotel or the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Maui? That's exactly what he had. And he knew they couldn't work. They couldn't eat. So those that had anything, they bought or they sold it. And they brought the proceeds. And my Bible says right at the end of chapter 4, I'm going to read it. It's, it's black ink on a white page. Having sold it, this man, Joseph, who the, the, who the apostles surnamed, or they renamed, they named him or gave him a new name, the son of we call it consolation. That's not a good interpretation. It's the son of encouragement. What did he encourage the people to do? What he did. Because they couldn't work. Therefore they didn't have anything. That's why Paul was going around all the time raising an offering for the poor saints in Jerusalem. Because the Jews still were running Jerusalem. Through the synagogue. And they were ruled over by the Romans. And so as a result of that. They were always poor. But there were people like. Barnabas that had something somewhere and he sold it and he brought the proceeds, he brought the money, it says money I'm reading it right here on the Bible, in the Bible, verse 37, chapter 4 and he laid it, it does not say at the deacon's feet it doesn't say he laid it at the feet of the finance committee or the CPA the Bible says he laid it at the apostles' feet and then they made distribution as they saw fit and if you don't like that, understand one thing. If you don't understand anything else, because tonight I'm going to pray a second prayer. I've come, here, I've come here to pray two prayers. And I'm going to pray this one in just a moment. And it's one that maybe you've seen before, but I don't think so. But tonight I will pray a prayer concerning one thing, the finisher's anointing. I've only been in the ministry 44 years. And the first thing that I had to do when the Lord called me was go tell my daddy who owned the butane propane company that was servicing all the oil there down in East Texas because my granddaddy was the superintendent of the Exxon oil refinery down there. He came home from World War II, my daddy, 82nd Airborne Paratrooper, three men out of his company got home alive, and he was one of the three that dropped them all behind enemy lines. Three men out of 500, the first 500, and then they brought 500 more, and there was three of them got home alive. My daddy was one of them. When he went with me to Korea and saw me preach at Dr. Cho's church, which I've been just excited right now preaching here to you as I was 60,000 people there in, in person. Now, I've got all those watching on TV. 
My daddy said, now I know why I live and all those good men died. Is to get you into this world. And he cried. It's the first time I'd ever seen my dad weep. Boy, it tore me up. He goes, Daddy. But I went in and told him, I'm called to preach. Jesus has spoken to me. Called me to preach. And I will go now to Dallas Baptist University and study. He said, if you walk out that door, it wasn't saved yet. I was 19 years old. He said, if, if you walk out that door, I'd already been preaching for a year and a half. You walk out that door to become a preacher, that's what you give your life to. You're my only son. And I'm going to give this butane propane fortune to you to run this business and keep it for generations in our family. You walk out that door, I'm going to give this business to your brother-in-law who writes you out of the will. I'm going to give it to your brother-in-law who is divorcing your sister. <laughs> And you ain't going to get anything ever again. He said it just like that. And I said the soft voice as I walked out. Well, I reckon we'll see if God's real now. And shut the door behind him. Fourteen years later, Daddy was walking down the aisle. When we moved into our new auditorium, the church on the rock. Are y'all listening to anything yet? He pulled over by the side of the road. He'd been an alcoholic, self-medicating all the way since he'd come home from World War II. Lord, my son would have got saved one day and said, Jesus, if you can do anything with an old drunk like me, I give my life to you. How many know what God will do every time I'm in prayer like that? Come on, somebody, help me pray to God and say to heaven. Then he's been in heaven now for about 20 years. But for the next eight and a half years, Daddy led the church in tithing. He didn't give me anything, but he, he underwrote the church practically all by himself. It takes some Barnabases, some sons of encouragement. They're going to sell what they had bringing. I watched him do it over and over and over. I was number two every year. Because he called my business manager on December the 30th. How much did Dr. Lee give? That's me. And he said, uh, he'd tell him, because they were fishing buddies, he's, and he'd write a check for that much money and one more dollar on January the 1st. <laughs> he did it year after year after year. And you, you want to know something? I was mighty proud of him. Yeah. And so was everybody else. Amen. Oh, we never missed a payment on anything. We saw the hand of God. But it started with 14 people in the back room of the skating rink. We were praying with all our might, come Holy Spirit, power. Let us see your power. One night, a lady screamed. She was in the back, like the lady back there. She screamed to the top of her lungs. And I said, oh, God, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. It was not. It was a Texas-sized rat running across the rack right behind my head. About as big as my head running right behind my head. Like, oh, God. Like that. I'm telling you, it was not a glorious beginning. It stunk back there. Finally, we got the skating rink floor, then we went to the high school, and when we got to high school, the church was six or eight hundred people by that time. We were sixteen we were sixteen months old, I get a call from the chief of police. He says, Now Larry, there's gonna be somebody walk into your building, and when you see him, you'll know who it is. Because he's gonna be looking at you with that look that men give each other when they don't it's not a nice look. He tried to explain it to me as, 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 you know, with as much decorum as he could. He said, look, Dr. Lee, he said, I don't mind to say this to you, but he beats up preachers. Because he was raised in church, but he never met God and he's mad at preachers about it. I said, well, I pretty well understand that. I'll be looking for him. What's his name? He said, his name is Dwayne Ray. And when he comes to your church, you better have some men around you because it takes four officers on Saturday night. If there's not a fight in town, he'll start one. Because he's a, he rides bulls for a living. He wasn't a cowboy with a 10 gallon hat. He actually was a cow, a person who rode cows for a living. Y'all understand what I'm saying? And during the week, he's a fireman. And he, he, he'll get mad at preachers, and he'll pick one out about once every three or four months, and he will beat him within an inch of his life. So you better be ready. Well, about three weeks passed. I don't think any more about it, because I've been told things all my life. If you ever, anybody ever tells you something you don't think is true and find out later it's a lie, don't, 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 don't call them a liar. Just say, well, that's an interesting story. Because <laughs> love believes all things. And, 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 I, and I looked up, and there he came. Boy, when he walked in, I said, there's Dwayne Wright. <laughs> Boy, he had, that, he had that skin looked like leather on his face, that red, ruddy looking. And, and that look in his eye, like I, I, left eye cocked at you. <laughs> And boy, I knew that I knew that my day would come. <laughs> well, I said, stand up. He'd sit down. I'd say, sit down. Then he'd stand up and stare. Boy, he'd sit in the back where he, nobody could see him, he thought. Well, I saw him. 
First thing he ever said to me was after church, I thought he was going to do it right in the altar. I thought we were going to throw down right in the altar. He walks up to me and said, well, one thing I know about you, you're either straight from heaven or straight from hell because you ain't anything in between. You know God or you know something in the spirit realm. That's what he said. He's staring at me. The next time I talked with him was on a Wednesday night after I, I was closing up like, that, like pastors do when they birth the church, locking the door of the high school auditorium where we were meeting and I was going out to my Volkswagen Rabbit that I drove during all those years. I had a diesel yellow Volkswagen Rabbit. Black smoke coming out the back. Y'all know. And uh, he steps out from behind a, a, a concrete block there that was one of the pillars of the, of the auditorium and he said, hey! Like that. I wheeled around and there it was, me and Dwayne in the dark. <laughs> Look at one another. He said, you'll go out to the truck with me? <laughs> and I looked at him for a minute and I said to, my, I said to myself, I, I'm a lover, not a father. <laughs> I said, well, I've been out to the truck with some good old boys like you before. And it never worked out good for me when I did it. But Daddy did not raise a coward. So let's go. And I walked out right beside him and I seen my life pass right in front of me. I saw my own birth. I saw the day I went in first grade. I was walking through the days of my life when I graduated from high school. I saw myself. I saw when I graduated from college and seminary. And I saw my children. I saw everything. I was about to meet God, I thought. He opens the front door of that old Chevrolet beat up, old pickup truck, and takes a boot. And he thrust it into my chest. And he said, well, there it is. And I, I said, well, I was trying to sound real masculine and big and strong, but my voice cracked. I said, well, what is it? I said, well, what is it? Said, what, is it? Said, what is it? He said, that's my time. He said, you see, I'm not saved. But one thing I know for sure, a man can't rob from God and get along well in this world. And I've been tithing to my work boot looking for my preacher because next Sunday I'm going to get saved in your church. And here's my time and put his heart into my hand. That day, or where your treasure is, somebody say it. And I took it home. It was a little over $1,640. I called our, our, our men together, our elders, and I told them this story. And Dwayne did not show up for the song service the next Sunday, and I was looking for him all during the song service, and all of a sudden, when I got up to preach, he stood in the back. And I gave the invitation for people that wanted to be added to the Lord. he came running down before I ever got it out of my mouth, and tears were streaming down his face. And I mean, people from all over the church knew him. Everybody in the county knew him. They ran and fell on him and wept. And he wept his way to God. And I stood there with this old work boot. It was empty. And I said, you, I'm going to tell you the story. And I told the people the story while he's getting saved at my feet. I was not receiving an offering, but I dropped the work boot down the altar. And a million four hundred thousand dollars went into that work boot in the next 16 months. Somebody say the hand of God. Amen. We bought 50 acres on the freeway from the back room of the rat field skating ring. Somebody say, glory to, glory to God. And I wasn't so impressed with the acreage that God gave us or the buildings that God gave us. I was impressed that when we prayed, something supernatural happened. The hand of God, just like when Jesus touched that leper, the hand did something immediately. Just like when Peter touched that lame man with wobbly feet, the hand of God was straight from When they prayed with one accord, I wasn't so impressed that the place was shaken. I was impressed that they were shaken so greatly they couldn't help but speak the word with boldness. And the Bible says that, that, that they were all moved and filled with the Spirit to the point that they had to speak the word. They couldn't go anywhere without telling. Two and a half, three years ago now, oh, I'm sorry, two years ago. My goodness. Sixteen months ago only. I gained 50 pounds in four days. Where my kidneys stopped working. Yep, this one day, I started gaining weight and feeling terrible and didn't know why. Went to the doctor and said, well, your kidneys are failing. I'd been cured 13 years before 
from what the doctor said, but we don't know if we can get it. It's moving so fast through your body. I had cancer. My daddy died of cancer. My mother died of cancer. They said, if it's in your family, you probably won't make it through this. That was, that was 13 years ago. I have had not one ounce of cancer in my body in 13 years. Somebody said, praise the Lord. And because I had allowed the doctors to do some radiation on my body, when my kidneys failed, they said anybody that's had any radiation put in their internal organs where the cancer was located. And by the way, I was cured before the radiation was finished. And I told the doctors and they agreed. But they said if they ever, if you were ever irradiated through radiation, if your internal organs start failing, they fail one after the other, you're going to just go down. So the family had been called. I blew up like a, somebody put an inner tube, a, 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 a pump on a tire and blew my head up, looked like a basketball. With two eyes and a mouth and a nose, didn't it look like me? And I was laying in the bed, getting excited. I never asked Jesus one time to heal me. Because I've been declaring, now at that time, for 42 years, you are my healer. I wasn't going to make him anything. I was worshiping him that he is my healer. And he becomes who you worship him to be in your life. You praise Him every day as your provider, you'll have enough. Because He'll become that in your experience. Prayer, true prayer, is declaration, not uh, entreaty. It's, it's faith declarations. All of the prayer that teaches us how to pray is a declaration. You are my Father. Praise be to your name. You are my righteousness, sanctification, peace. You are the one present in my life. You are my healer. You are my provider. That's all those names are the compound names of God in the Old Testament, all comprehended in one name. The name that is above every name. They all point to one man, the mediator between God and man, who did not die 50% or 70% death. How many know he did not die 90% death? But he died what? 100%. And said it is finished. And tonight I'm going to pray for you to experience a finisher's anointing. You may not want that anointing, and if you don't want it, don't come back here tonight because anybody I pray for in this room tonight will finish your course with joy and the race that is set before you. And if you'd rather stay on and watch television, have a good life. You may not finish it with joy. Because God spoke to me and said, this day is ordained. He set it aside for you to get two prayers. The first prayer that I prayed today is about what happened right after Barnabas was, was renamed. He was called the son of encouragement because he encouraged the entire church and they all began to do what he did. And everybody had enough. Somebody say everybody had enough. Everybody had enough. Because somebody hurt God and did it. Yes. One thing to hear him, it's another thing to obey him. And they prayed and they obeyed. What should we do, O oh Lord? And they sowed and they saw the hand of God Meeting everybody's needs. Well, there was a couple there that said, hey, we want to get our names written in the Bible too. Their names were Ananias and Sapphira. It's the next, very next verse in the Bible. There's no chapter, uh, numbers, nor commas, nor periods in the Bible. This was a book written. It said, after Barnabas sold the land, put it at the apostles' feet, now Ananias and Sapphira. Now, you know what Ananias and Sapphira did, don't you? They said they were bringing... They served something to the Lord. We don't know exactly the amount that it doesn't say. They said they were doing something for the church. But what they were wanting was to get their name written like Barnabas in the Bible. Well, they made the Bible. They got what they wanted, but they did not want what they got. Because they thought they were just dealing with a cool thing called the church. Where the miracles were just following up these apostolic ministries. And, and the word of God was flowing. And it was the Jesus movement in the first century, if you will. Yeah. It was just cool to be in it. You could let your hair grow long. And people wouldn't talk bad about you. Or you had no hair and be alright too. You wear a t-shirt or you wear a suit. Just as long as you're in love with Jesus. That's all that matters. And you got a case of the King help us. Well, they said to themselves, hey, we're going to tell them. Tell Peter and them we're going to give this, but we're going to keep back part for us, of course. And Peter makes it abundantly clear in his discourse with them two things. Number one, while it was yours, you didn't ever have to give anything. Now, y'all listen. I didn't ever put an apostle.
apostolic mandate on one of you to give a nickel. That's what he says to them, in essence. He says, while it was yours, did I ever make you do it? In other words, you have lied not to a man named Simon Peter, again, discerning in the Spirit. You're not just talking to a man, but you lied to God when you lied to me. And Ananias, the man, he drops dead, and there was a group of young men that obviously, this was their ministry. Their ministry was everybody lied at church, dropped dead. And they, they said that certain young men came and gathered them up and did their ministry. They married me. Wouldn't you like to have that ministry? Wouldn't it be something if God started moving this year and everybody lied to God got to go to heaven immediately or wherever they were, your eternal reward left them? Amen. Oh, I didn't see everybody jumping up and saying, let me have that. But that's a, the ministry. And, and the wife comes in in a few hours and says, yes, we gave such and such. She lies again. She lies too. Now, but if you don't like this, go take your magic marker and write it out of the Bible because it's in the context of the Scripture. It's, it's exactly what happened. And, she, and Peter said, why have you conspired together with your husband to lie, not to men, but to God? Because while you had it, it was all yours. You never had to give anything. But you have said you're bringing all, and what you did was bring part and held back for yourself the rest, saying you've done what Barnabas had done. And they lied not to men. They were like to God. The same men that carried your husband out, Peter said, are about to carry you out, sister. And she drops dead. And they bury her. Now I'm coming to the text. Everything up to this point has been good. But I've just been warming up. Here we go. Now watch this. Verse 13 and 14 of Acts chapter 5. And I'll close. Then it says in verse 13, Yet none of the rest dared join them. Let me read it again. Yet none of the rest dared. They wouldn't even do it on a dare. Like I dare you join that group. Nobody of the rest, those that were just coming because it was exciting and cool and they were going to get in on the free stuff. Yet none of the rest dared join them but the people, that is the Jewish people, began to esteem them highly. In the next chapter, it said a whole company of the same priests that crucified Christ got saved. Right after the deacons were ordained. You can read it later. And believers, nevertheless, were increasingly added to the Lord. Somebody say multitudes. Multitudes. Now there's two kind of people here. Those that are now repelled by this gospel of Jesus Christ. And those that are drawn irrevocably. And bonded themselves to the house of God. I call this God's magnet. Because all of you know a magnet has two poles. A positive pole and a negative pole. The prayer that God sent me to pray today is a simple prayer. God send your magnet in every person in this room. If you don't want it in you, then get out the back door right now. Run! Because you're going to have a pole a magnet put into your spirit by my prayer today that's going to repel those that aren't supposed to be in your life and draw those that, that are supposed to be. And you as a church, I'm loosing the magnet. That's how we pray, by the way, in Rockwall. We don't want anybody that's not supposed to be here, Lord, but give up north, south, east, and west. Everyone that's supposed to be in this house. And multitudes were at it. A week, David, for 50, I'm sorry, for three years in a row, 156 weeks, we added 100 new people. Are y'all listening to this? And the church leveled off at 11,000 in a town of 5,000. And I started four other churches in the Metroplex and gave them all 1,000 people and at least 250, 300,000 dollars. And I rotated all over. Back in the 80s, all that was it all about. That's what I was doing. Then one day the Lord said, give it all to me. Sow it all to me. And you will suffer greatly, but I'll give you the nations of the world. I'm coming back to when I met with your pastor just a couple weeks ago before I prayed. 
The next morning after I talked to you, the bishop from Africa that had brought a delegation of pastors from throughout his network of pastors was there. I had never met this man before, but I'd heard of him. He's quite famous in Africa. The Lord had told me now this season of pressing to get people to pray globally. I've been, I've been to, as I said, 61 nations again and again and again for 23 years. That's all I've done. He said, that season is over in your life. You're going to enter into a brand new place. You're going to do something new. I'm going to tell you what it is in just a second. But I'm going to open a brand new door. This man on the front row leaned over and said, I didn't know what the word meant, but God spoke to me and said, a portal has just been opened for you. He had to look the word up. It means a door of opportunity. Amen. And it's a new beginning. You say, I'll always preach on prayer because I can't help it. But I'm not pressing to try to get a number because the Lord had told me, give him 300,000. We did that. We went past it. We went to 370,000 America. And then he said, go to the nation and give me at least a million out of the nation. He said, you've gone far past that. One morning in prayer about three months ago, he said, you're no longer constrained to go for that purpose. Because you've gone far past it. I said, God, you're going to have to confirm that to me. And all of a sudden, I started getting confirmations from all over the world where I preached from Hong Kong to Jerusalem to London, England, all the way down to the Isle of Nations, everywhere you can imagine, riding trains, planes, and automobiles. By myself, pulling my own bag usually. Because I divested myself of everything in the world, for real. No savings accounts. No, no retirement accounts. Nothing. Cars and houses, everything. Gone. Why? Because I said, I'm going to go where you want me to go, go and I'm not going to be hindered by anything in this world. I'm never going to tell the preacher I can't afford it because I've got a big old budget from a big old fat ministry. And I'm going to marry myself to local pastors around the world as an illustration of apostolic prophetic ministry doing what they did in the first century. Not going to have Larry Lee Ministries Inc. over here so big and fat it can't come to David Sears Church on Pentecost Sunday when God told them to. Are you hearing anything? Bishop from Africa who I never met turned to me and he, when I was introduced to preach, he said, you cannot be Larry Lee. You're not the, could you not carry one hour author, are you? You're not the man that preached on prayer throughout Africa, are you? I've never met you. I said, well, yeah, I'm him. He said, we all believe in Africa. You've got to be at least 90 years old. But he said, these words, you never have to come to Africa again. Because every Christian I know in Africa has a Bible and that prayer guide that's in that teaching that you gave on prayer. And that's how we pray throughout all of Africa. And I, I'm humored at people that walk up to me now that I'm preaching back in America that say, well, I'm sure glad you got back in the ministry. <laughs> Even they don't think the souls of the Africans and the Chinese and the Latin Americans are as precious as, as Tulsa souls. <laughs> or... I, I, I didn't ever, I didn't tell anybody I was going. <laughs> and I didn't tell on purpose. Why? Lots of reasons. But I saw his hand more in the last 23 years than I did before. Amen. Then I get a call on the phone. Just right before I got sick. And it was the cowboy. I hadn't spoken to him in 15 or so years. He married our babysitter that had four girls. One of their girls' name was Rebecca. And he said, pray for Rebecca. I said, what's wrong, Dwayne? How are you doing? He said, it's terrible. She, her F-150 Ford pickup got T-boned by an 18-wheel tractor trailer rig. And she's dead, except for the machines keeping her alive at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. Her brain waves are still there, but her organs are just... So bad, he said, the worst one is her liver. It's completely severed into two pieces. And they cannot repair a completely severed liver. It cannot be transplanted either. There's nothing can be done. And the doctors have come and said, Dwayne, we cannot just keep pumping blood into that body. She's gone. But her brain waves are still working. He said, well... I won't let you take her off the machines until I talk to the man of God. You see, he did not discern me as a good old boy from East Texas. The 
walked away from a beauty tank uh, fortune. Broke bank fortune. He didn't discern me as somebody trying hard to preach a sermon. He discerned me as the Lord would discern me as the Lord discerns you. How many you know he, God looks at you differently than anybody else? Make case like this, but I'm going to go eat with you. Jesus saw one of his sheep up in a tree. And they saw a, a crooked tax collector. I don't know how you're looking at people today, but I'll tell you how he's looking at you. With eyes and a heart of everlasting love. Wooing you and drawing you. He said, I won't let them take her off the machines until you tell me what God is saying about it. And he was crying. It was something for me to hear that cowboy cry. I said, the way I'm going into my office where there's an altar and I'm going to lay there until I hear God. And in 24 hours to this minute, you call me back and I'll have a word from God for you. How many of you like to be able to have somebody go get a word from God for you? I've got a word from God for you right now. If you ask God to put a magnet in me, that magnet's going to start pushing people away from you and then that aren't supposed to be there and drawing people, places, and things to you that are supposed to be yours. Anybody need that today? Does this church need that today? Oh, the rest are so enjoying that today because it's not cool. It's not just a cool little Jesus thing where we can get free food. Well, we've got our little social fellowship down there with the church. And over on David. Now, sir, the house of God with a man of God. That's how God was in. I went and laid down on my face. And I started to pray, but I couldn't get a word out of my mouth. I heard, before I hit the floor, the Spirit of God said, Now you will see my hand. That's all I heard. Then I prayed. And I prayed and prayed and prayed. And said, Tell me what to say. Now. He said, Lord, told me. He kept, that's all he said. He didn't say the hand of God taking her to heaven, hand of God healing her, hand of God anything. Now you see my hand. 24 hours to that hour, he, the Wayne Ray, the cowboy that had gotten saved, started a miracle where I saw his hand in all the little bitty town, smallest town in the state of Texas. Interestingly now, 25 years later, is the wealthiest county per capita household in the whole state of Texas. The people trying to run me off Every time I go to Rockville, they honor me. Why? Because the windows of heaven open. And let me tell you something about those windows in heaven. When they open, they'll fall. The blessing will fall on anybody that's under there. The wealthiest county was the smallest and the poorest. And now it's the wealthiest. Per capita income household is the smallest tiny little county. It is geographically, numerically, the smallest county. It's per capita of the wealthiest county in Texas. Twenty-four hours later, I get the call. It's the cowboy. He says to me, he says, I believe. He called me pastor. Pastor, what did the Lord say? I said, Dwayne, I'm going to tell you exactly what I heard. And he had the speaker muted on a, on a speaker phone somehow in the waiting room. I said, I heard these words. Now you will see my hand. And I could hear everybody in the room as you came on the speaker phone. And all I heard was shrieks, screams. People I heard weeping and some others I heard shouting. I had no idea what I had said. And I didn't know what had happened over the 24 hours. But after I heard it, I spoke it. And when I spoke it, I knew whatever that was, that hand, that does immediately and suddenly, whether it's through a man named Peter or, a man, or, or through Christ Jesus, who is the Lord, is the same Holy Spirit. I said, what happened? He said, they went in about an hour and a half after I talked to you. I don't know if you prayed right then, like you said you're going to. I said, yeah, I went straight from my telephone to the altar. He said, that's what God said to you. I said, yes. He said, they came back in and they brought three medical doctors in with the specialists and they were all staring at two sets of x-rays. And the second set of x-rays, they were analyzing critically, carefully, and they said, my God, that's a hand connecting the two pieces of the severed liver. There's fingers. Now those are flanges, they still call them, in a proper term. There's fingers that are connecting the liver of this woman. All of a sudden, they said, what is that? They cannot be there. That can't be a hand.
that in her liver? They said, let's take another x-ray. They waited an hour and a half, and there was less hand while the liver was moving together. Three hours later, they take another x-ray. They can still see the hand of the liver. It's closer. Less hand, liver moving together. In five hours, the liver had come back together, and the hand was once again this one. Are y'all hearing me? I believe that was the hand. The hand of God. It's all the way from the right. Didn't have time to preach a theological message to you. Just to say when he reaches out his hand, he puts a magnet on the inside. And right now you're being drawn to Jesus or you're being repelled by me. I repulse you or I draw you right now to my Savior. Months pass and I had this thing hit me. My kidneys, they call in the family. I was in the hospital nine days and on the fourth day, a great light shone in the corner of my room. In the midst of that presence, there was a figure standing. And I slapped myself thinking I had was having a hallucination to see if I was dreaming. And I realized I'm awake. Four o'clock in the morning. The, 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 it was an actual circumference of a cloud. This figure like uh, in the corner, about, about eight feet by five feet. And there, in the midst, was a presence. I thought, baby, I was going to heaven. I thought he'd come. That was probably the angel of the Lord. He was going to give me time. And I, all I could say, ladies and gentlemen, to Jesus, because I thought that might be Jesus there in the midst of that glory. And there was such glory in the room. I cannot describe it to you. I cannot help but tell you about it. Because the doctors make me tell it. My three doctors make me tell it. If I don't tell it, I have lied to the doctors. For all I can say was I love you. I did not speak in tongues. For tongues had said this. I was in the presence. Ready to go. And I could only say I love you. I love you. I love you. And then I'd see your faces. Those of you that somehow were fruit from this ministry at any level. I would see people I didn't know, but mainly were the people I knew. Those I had led to Christ or those that sat under this ministry or had been greatly affected by it. I saw them walking with me into the presence of God. And I, and I wasn't so excited about that as I was just Him. And all I could say was, I love you. Does anybody love Him here today? The only reason I'm asking the lady to come to the instrument and play softly is not because of, I, I don't need ambiance. This is the Spirit of God. See, when the music starts, the demons shut up. Amen. They can't, they can't interfere now. And anyway, but generally they try, but they won't once you start. I, 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 I didn't tell anybody about it. Because it was so private, it was so unbelievably worship. It was so other than this world. I was at Dickens Hospital in Oklahoma City, by the way. My doctors, I had two Christian doctors, but the specialist was a Muslim. He was so Muslim, his first name was Ali, and his second name was Ali. <laughs> that was his name, Dr. Ali, Ali. And I had been witnessing to him while dying, I thought, and as he told others, very softly, I've been telling him we all came from the father Abraham, Muslims, Jews, and Christians. But the difference between those two and Christianity, true Christianity, was a resurrection from the dead by our Savior, the mediator, Christ Jesus. That's the only difference. They all have proper mores except for the jihadists. But right and wrong is something you do in the flesh. It has nothing to do with the resurrected Christ living his life through your body. That's Christianity, by the way. Christ is the end of the law for those who believe on Christ. Romans 10 and 3. The second morning, which was about my sixth day of the hospital, the, the presence came again exactly at the same time. 4 a.m. We stayed until 7. Again, I love you. Why don't you just tell me if you do? Do you love me? I mean, really, do you love me? I don't know where he, he brought you from, but I can tell you some places he brought me from that will blow your mind. And I don't have time because I want to bring this for you. Love. 
I said, I don't want that. I was all hooked up to all kinds of instruments and tubes. They had put a port in my chest and had done three dialysis and we did the fourth one that day. Kidneys at 9.9 .9 are as dead as the chair you're sitting on right now. It cannot be raised from the dead, actually. And particularly after you do dialysis four times, that's when they take all your blood out, clean it, cleanse it, cleanse it, and put it back in your body clean. He did not say one word to me in three hours. All I did was say, ah, oh, I couldn't stop saying it. I think we're going, when we've been there 10,000 years, we'll be just, we'll, that'll just be forming up our praise. Eternity is for eternity. And I love it. And I'd see the faces of those walking with me. I was thinking he was coming to pray. And in the other hours of the day, the nurses would come and want it all on their break. They would all come in and say, get in the room. They said, what is in this room? I'm talking about three and four at a time. There's a presence in here. Can we just take our break in here? We don't want to drink coffee. If you don't like it, I wouldn't say it. I never said a word. But such an unknown. Third morning, W. That began at 4 a.m. And I heard, I heard words from him that morning that were disappointing words. I thought for sure he was going to reach out his hand and say, Come on, that's you know what he did? He spoke and he said, You are healed. And at 7 a.m. he left. Dr. Ali Ali did his morning rounds about 9 30 that same morning. I said, Dr. Ali, I don't know how to tell you this. And I know what you've got to say because one of my doctors is in human behavior. I know you've got to tell me. Anybody as sick as I am will have visions and aberrations of the mind. I know you have to say those words. So you save your words. The Lord was in this room this morning. And yesterday and the day before. In a cloud of glory. And this morning he said, I'm healed. He said, well, we'll see. He said, I would tell you you're a little bit crazy. Or you're just real, real sick. But he said, my Catholic wife woke me up at midnight and we prayed for you to 4 a.m. this morning. A Muslim and a Catholic. <laughs> None of them graduated from Rama or Old Walker's University. <laughs> at 3 that afternoon, in walks my internal specialist, Dr. Ali Ali, Dr. Laura Spearman. Spearman, a urologist. They stand there for this moment and stare at me. Now, I'll look at Dr. Ali, because he's the leading kidney specialist in the Southwest. Dr. Ali said, Don't ever say this was a medical nerve. That's where I started. Your kidneys have jump started, they're functioning by themselves. I said, What's the number? He said, well, the perfect number is 1.1. I said, what's my number? He said, 4.7. I said, come back in the morning. Because when God does it, he does it all the way. He'll take wobbly feet and feel ankle bones. The next morning, they came in and said, Dr. Lee, the part three of them. Your kid's at 1.7. I said, what does that mean? He said, that's as good as anybody walking down the street right now ever would expect. They're working perfectly. I said, come back this afternoon, I ain't perfect. Somebody said he only does good things. Only that he does all things well. He finishes. He finishes. That afternoon, they all three came back about 4.30 and said, you're at 1.1. 1 .1. I, I, I. I said, it must have been the hand. I said, Lord. The Muslim doctor said, you must give me your word to tell us every word you've done. I said, now do you believe? He said, I believe in your God. Because your God raises the dead. Because your kidneys were as dead as dead could be. The next day they're rolling me down the same corridor 
that they took me in to put this six inch by three inch port in my chest. And thinking this hospital's been there, I don't know how many decades, but I think nearly a hundred years. I don't know how long, but the doctor that's gonna perform this operation to remove this port, that they put here, they run the tube over your clavicle, right straight into your heart to take the blood out to put it back in. They say to me, we put in thousands of these. He said, to my knowledge, we should never remove one. Wow. Until right now. What? Wow. Did he do it? Because for years and years and years, he had something else prepared for me to do. It was a poor thing. Because years and years and years I've been declaring you're mine. You're home wrong. Yeah. I, I didn't make him my healer. He already was my healer. But my praise mixed with faith equal the manifestation of who he was in my life. I never asked him to heal me there on that day. I worship him. You see, I sow to the Spirit. From the Spirit I reaped. How many know when you sow to God? Sometimes you wait back what money cannot buy. I couldn't be here today. Oh, by the way, I lost these 50 pounds. I'm in my fight weight right now. I'm 180, 5 feet, 11 inches tall. And I'm ready for the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. I'm ready to preach. In other words, if you go there this morning in front of this prayer, put a magnet. God puts you a magnet that repels those that aren't supposed to be here and irrevocably draws those who are chosen by God, stamped out, pre-prepared to be in this house. Push away everything from their lives that does not belong there and draw in everything the Holy Spirit has for them. Lord, meet their needs, not according to their needs, but according to your riches and glory. Lord, let them learn that when they pray, if they'll simply obey, they'll see the hand of God. Yeah. Father, today I'm doing what you told me to do. Now, y'all join me if you want this. If this isn't repelling you and pushing you away, like the negative pole of a magnet will do, but it's drawing you to say, I love you, Jesus. If this word is wooing you and drawing you, lift up your hand without wrath and without doubt. For I am not speaking about a gospel of 2,000 years ago only. I am preaching to you that what he did 2,000 years ago is now present in this room. The kingdom of God is at hand. The hand of God is wanting to impute that is put into you a spiritual magnet. Everybody that wants it, lift your hands as if you we're about to go to heaven. This is your last prayer. Father, you see the hands lifted. And they can say the words after me. Or they can just whisper them in their mouth. But I want to encourage you to say, Heavenly Father. Just say that. Heavenly Father, by Jesus' name. Let that hand that brought immediately and suddenly a cleansed leper. Ankle bones. A liver put back together. Kidneys raised from the dead. The same Jesus. He is that magnet. Say that He is that magnet by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. I receive you now as a magnet in my soul, in my mind, on my body. On this day of Pentecost, I receive the Holy Spirit. And I acknowledge you right now, Lord. You can do anything you want to. Push out that which doesn't belong. Draw in everything you want. I trust you absolutely. Leave your hands up and pray for me, Father. Grace. 
through faith. And we were saved. As we received Him, therefore now we walk in Him. This is the word of the Lord. The hand of the Lord is loose. The Jubilee Christian Senator right now. I have never preached this message in my life. I have prayed it since 1979. Release the man. This is the word. This is the Put your hands down with your eyes closed. Look at this room. It's not yet a member of the Jubilee Christian Center. The Bible says the Lord added to the church those being saved. He didn't say added to the Lord. He didn't say added to the pastors or to the apostles. Added to the church, the Bible. Those being saved, those who had been saved or those who were coming to be saved. But they're added to the church. How many here are not yet members here, but you know that Pastor David's here, your pastor. And you're not ashamed of the Lord nor of David, that is your pastor. Because the Holy Spirit is added to it. You're not yet a member, but your hands down. You're not yet a member, but you say, pray for me, Dr. Lee. I'm going to pray a prayer over you that nothing but the will of God will repel everything that's bad for you and draw in everything good. You that are not yet members, but you're supposed to be, by the Spirit, added. Could you raise your hand right now and pray that over you? Right where you are. You're not yet a member, but I'm supposed to be. Just be right here. There's a couple of others. They're on their way. They're coming Father, over this lady, the Lord did not instruct me to bring you forward. But I'm reaching my hand to you. I'm coming to agreement. That's all I'll pray for her. You don't know who she is. I do. Lord, I pray for her. She is a representative. You represent the harvest that's on the way in here. Harvest time. You say, well, I've been here all these years, and we haven't had a great overflowing harvest. Expect it now. Here it comes. This lady represents it. She's one. But there'll be a day that'll be four. Maybe there'll be a day that'll be ten. And it won't be because you're preaching differently or you're doing better or worse. It's because God has put his hand in As a magnet drawing and repelling. And of the rest, there's no man join himself to be. But believers were added multitudes. Men and women. This woman, God bless you. You were added to this body by my word saith the Lord and you are added to this man of God and you will always bring forth fruit abundant through your life Jesus now look up at me before we close please don't leave because I'm going to have a pastor come close the service in just a moment I'm supposed to say this today for 23 years I've traveled the nations of the world since the church on the rocks we have a church in Bombay, David, that we planted over uh, uh, seven visits. But on one visit, there was a young man there. He had 120 people in the church. The next time I saw him was at Mike Murdoch's convention, World Convention. And he got up to give a testimony. He said, I cannot speak because the man that planted me in the church sitting right there and that. And he said, we now have 29,000 people in our church. I have a church in Bombay of 29,000. I just smiled and said, sure glad you're back in the ministry. The next man got up was from Costa Rica, the capital city. He said, I cannot speak because I was prejudiced Latin America. And I hated blue-eyed preachers with white skin because y'all are all so rich. He had everything you needed up there in America. But the, I heard those tapes on prayer. And God spoke to me and had that white man right there. He pointed at me. He said, we only had about 150 people. We had 23,000 now and 18,000 of our teenagers. I don't think y'all are serious. I know you're there. See, when you go to a prayer-based church, God can do anything he wants. It's not based on personality, but it's based on the man of God that's birthing you into prayer. And that's what it's all about. Then God's free to do great mighty things you never saw before. I mean, you know, if this church grew to, let's say, 5,000 people, y'all all said, we never saw anything like that before. How about 10,000? 
So that's impossible. Nothing, nothing will be impossible after the battle. For 23 years, I've carried my own bag, slept on trains, planes, automobiles, alone, most of the time. Stories being told that we're all just like most gossip. You know why I said judge not that you be not judged? Because you never have all the facts. He's got all the facts. I mean, you pass final judgment on somebody, you just judge yourself. Because you'll do the same thing you think they did. But later it or not, it'll be a boomerang get you right in the behind. You don't hear what I said? It'll boomerang right around that person and hit you behind. And you say, how'd that grab me? Read Romans 2 1. It says, you're inexcusable. Whoever judges another, because we're going to judge another, you'll do the same thing. If you can see it, you'll do it. And the Lord said, never defend yourself on your defender. Just go and do it. But recently, in the last two or three years, it said, sin has come to an end. You still always speak to a friend. But you're going to be constrained. No longer, and the constraint started leaving off of you. Because the man from Africa said everybody in Africa. The man from China said everybody in China. The man in Latin America said it's covered all of Latin America. I don't have a million. They say it's closer to 10 million. And there's a number no man can count. And so it's third, third or fourth generation. That you So the Lord spoke and he said, Now, I saved your life if you're going to build one more church. You will be responsible to build me one more great church. I know where it's going to be. I met one meeting. There were 12 people showed up. I told the guy who was going to do the music how many were coming before they came. He said, Dr. Lee, there's going to be hundreds of people. I said, no, we're going to be I have never told anybody about this. This is the first announcement that's ever been made about it. I felt led to make the announcement that I'm going to burn the church right on the ocean. I'm the Pacific Ocean. In a little bitty city. God spoke to me this morning. I said, by David, and, 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 and he just said, let the people sow today the first fruits offerings to the birth of that church. What if I gave you the opportunity today to, to buy the founder's stock of an Exxon, of Exxon Hall? My granddaddy bought founder stock in 1904. My mama never did anything after my daddy died. Did y'all hear what I just said? Because daddy got all the granddaddy stock and all the stock he bought. And I got my daddy sold for heaven. And he helped me build that church buildings. Y'all hear what I just said? This is going to be the first fruits option. It will be used for the birthing of this work out there. We need everything. Maybe we need chairs, sound systems. We need a building. We need everything. But how does it start? It starts with one person like another Joe somewhere. Joe says, well, I got this. I just guess I'll go sell that and bring that. He never thought about Nine chapters later, that was Acts 4, nine chapters later, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas, who used to be old Joe, and Saul, for the work I have appointed them. And they returned after the first missionary journey as Paul and Barnabas. And all the known world came to know Jesus, including you, because of a, a, a missionary, if you will, named Paul the Apostle, with a partner named Barnabas, who at one time, just an old child. You might have said, well, I'm nothing. Oh, you don't know who you are. See, I'd rather be who I am than, I, than Jerry Jones that owns Dallas Capitol with a billion dollars in the bank. I'd rather be standing here with nothing in the natural and have fruit that's already in heaven and much is more coming. Come on, somebody. Amen. How many would like to get some stock in this portal that opened? This man of God 
said, I had to look my word up. Was there a new part of the world? It was a direct hit. And I was sitting there in the Lord and said, let this offering be sung as a first for its own. Amazing, Lord. It's going to tell you you're doing it. Tell me this announce it right here at your church, David. Someday, 10 years from now, you'll still be alive. Jesus, Terry, and you'll be still keeping your leg. Hallelujah. Amen. What a man. What a man of God. I'm going to ask y'all to do one thing. Let's all stand one more time and I'll have you be saved. Lift your hands one more time. I know you don't normally do this, but this isn't a Pentecostal prayer posture. This is a Bible prayer posture. We the preacher lift hands. Because when you open up your hands, you open up your heart, the psalmist said. Say this word out loud. Jesus. Jesus. You would never deceive us. Never deceive us. Whatever, I sow, Whatever I sow, that shall I also reap. I and I will reap because I, I won't quit. Right now, Jesus, what do you want me to sow as a first fruits? I know you're going to pay me back exceeding abundantly above. Now stand up your hands up for just a minute. Lord, talk to men and women that need a supernatural hand to promote them. Job, that became Barnabas, was a co-apostle who, who brought the gospel to me because of one offering. Father, as we sow our treasure, our hearts are revealed. So don't let us sow an unacceptable sacrifice. Somebody say, acceptable sacrifice is what you speak to me. What you impress on my mind is the right thing. That's acceptable. If you, if you, if you give, you give $2,000 and the Lord said give 500 then that's an unacceptable sacrifice. Only what he says. Whatever Jesus says, go do that. Say, That's all I ever say about God. How many will obey the Lord when we're so in my hand? I want that big bucket down there. What y'all do that big bucket? I had that. Just said it right there. It says they laid it, the offerings. They brought it in front of the apostles' feet. My feet are size 11 and a half D. 12 D in some shoes. But they mean nothing in the place. But what feet always represent is authority. You put your foot down on somebody, get authority over it. This authority is not inordinate, unclean spiritual authority. It is ordained of God. When he led captivity captive, he gave gifts to him some apostles, prophets, and angels. Jesus was the apostle. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to go somebody. When you get your offering prepared, make it out to Jubilee. Or just play JCC. We'll run out. This offer will run straight through the church, and I trust that it's here for my life. Hey, David, say, Well, I'm getting Jubilee Worship Center. I'm so glad I got that right. I knew Jubilee was right. Hey, W.C., I want you to run everything through the church. I don't take any names. I'll never call you back. You won't get a call. I've got one preacher I'm on his call list. He calls me five times a day. And I'm not mad at him. I just, that wakes me up in the middle of the night. And I'm on the other side of the world. My father. <laughs> I love him too. He's my friend. So Lord, bless, 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 multiply. Lord, sometimes it's in money, sometimes it's what money can't buy, but it's always according to your riches, not according to our needs. Somebody's hanging on to the money that can't make their aid. But God, you want to turn it into riches, transforming them from old Job to somebody like Moses. Nine chapters later, he becomes an apostle with Paul. God anoint this, anoint this, anoint every seed, every one. Don't let anybody lie to the Spirit. The Spirit says give $100. Please don't give $150. I mean it. I mean that. I'm not saying that. Random. That's not what a preacher said. It's normal. But that's what I say to you in Jesus' name. About four or five more. They're so precious to God that only God knows. There's a church that's going to be birthed you're going to hear about. It's going to take me about a year before you'll hear about it again. I'll build my leadership team first. Somebody said if you build the team, 
you'll always fill up the stands. Daddy took me in an old, uh, uh, Daddy took me, we, we have a, do you ever remember those station wagons that had a seat in the back that looked backwards? I was nine years old, looking backwards out the back door with three other little knotheaded teenagers in these states. And the Daddy and his buddy took all of us to see the Dallas Cowboys and they played in the cotton ball still. Daddy LeBaron is the first quarterback. He was five foot seven inches tall, the shortest quarterback ever played. Some of y'all remember Eddie LeBaron. I got to meet him. He lived in Las Vegas, Nevada. A judge, Supreme Court judge, is his partner. They're both lawyers. And that Supreme Court judge is a Jew, not a Christian. He moved me into his house that he moved out of. He was trying to sell it. He said, here, I'll carry the note. You just live in it. I said, well, what do you want for it? He said, $700,000. I said, what's the appraised value? He said, $1.9 million. I said, sir, you're giving me a $1.2 million for equity. He said, yes. Why? He said, I'm drawn to you. I don't think y'all heard what I just said. I'm drawn to you. There's a magnet in you right now. Of the rest, there's no man. Join. I believe it's right. You see the two poles? Somebody said God's man. Is it me? It's in us. I mean, can say that you got fed today. Did you learn it? Did you grow? Did you hear anything that will feed you? Now, can I ask you a second? I just said it's good enough to come back tonight to get the second purpose. Tonight, I preach about the finisher's anointing. My God. All of y'all want to finish. Everybody's going to finish. Like the old lady told my daddy, look, he worked with alcoholics all his life. She said, well, I'm just not going to grow old gracefully. Daddy looked back at her and said, well, honey, whether you grow old gracefully or ungracefully, you're going to grow old. <laughs> you can say you're not going to die, but you will die. Unless you're a bachelor. I pray I'm preaching when he comes. I pray I'm standing just like this and all of a sudden, I pray you're not still looking for me. I pray you're flying with me. Amen. Amen. I love all of you from my heart because you love that man. And I pray that at some point along the way, I'll never forget you though. Is it true? Is it true? I didn't know who you were, but I knew you. Because I'm not looking at you in the flesh. I'm looking at you through the eyes. They say, come on, Zacchaeus. The day, the child of Abraham, that was after he made restitution. He sold half his goods to the poor. He gets heart. And the rich young ruler wouldn't do it. I get that time. If I could keep on preaching until this time tomorrow, and I wouldn't be hungry. Y'all remember when Paul preached till midnight that night? The guy was sitting in the third story in the window, three story up. His name's Judas. He preached till midnight, probably started at sun, said. He preached six hours. The guy goes to sleep and falls out and kills himself by accident. Paul went down and raised him from the dead, stuck him back in the window, and I promise you, the man of God said, don't you ever go to sleep on me and don't you ever watch the clock. Because I'm here to preach and I might not be back. And he preached till daylight. He was very secret sensitive, wasn't he? Somebody give the Lord praise. North, south, east, west, give up, hold not back. That which God has prearranged and ordained for this church, we don't want nobody that's not supposed to be here. Prayed it. And you know, it's interesting. You said 23 years you're starting church. This October will be here 23 years. Now, it's interesting because we started as he was going to the nations. And now he's back here 23 years later. He's getting ready to plant a church. 
one of these days I want you to dive in at the breach. Okay. Wow. He preached for me and I did the breach.
worship your holy name worship your holy name.